It's one of those cameras that when you use it for yourself, you understand it. I understood a lot of the frustration from a lot of the people because Lumix have been I mean, they're sort of dragging their heels a little bit, if I'm being honest, with their next flagship. And I think, like me, a lot of people were expecting the latest flagship. Yeah, I mean, when the ZV-E 10 Mark II was announced, I sort of went to the sort of bigger YouTubers and I was like, you know, I got my popcorn ready and I was like, okay, let's read the comments. Let's see what people are saying about this camera. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about probably one of the most misunderstood cameras in 2024, the Lumix S9. And joining me talking about this conversation and is returning from across the pond is a very, very talented Brit named Josh Cameron, who, if you don't know who Josh Cameron is, you most likely probably do if you already watched any videos about the Lumix S9. And we're going to be diving into talking about the kind of Lumix S9 versus the Sony EV10 Mark II and kind of why that camera didn't get so much flack in comparison to the Lumix S9. So again, welcoming back uh, for the second time is Josh. Welcome back to my show, man. It's very, very nice to be back. Good to see you again, Nice mate. to see you. What, uh, what have you been up to since Japan? Uh, lots of work, lots of filming YouTube videos, um, using the S9 a whole bunch. It's actually become the camera that I use the most for my day-to-day -day stuff. Of course, the S5 II and the S52X still come out with me for the client shoots, but for my fun stuff and for YouTube, the S9 has been my ride or die, to be honest. Yeah, it's great. How about you, man? How are you? Oh, I've been so good. I've been so busy. I've been traveling like nonstop this entire summer for work. Um, which I guess traveling for you in comparison is only like maybe 30 to two hours of a drive, correct? Going some different city <laughs> or even to a different country. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, recently I went to Corfu with Emily and it was, uh, the flight there was three hours. Oh my so gosh, yeah, yeah. We, we can get to a different country in a couple of hours, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the beauty of being in Europe, I guess. Yeah, it's, it was like, uh, my traveling's all like four hours and I'm in like the same country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's massive. Same state probably. Sometimes, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> But so today we're going to be kind of diving into that topic um, about that Lumix S9. And we were both in Japan. We both got it. We were both using it. You ended up getting black, correct? Yes, the best color. I, oh, that's, that's a <laughs> bold statement. I will say I feel like what you could do with the black is you could take a little Leica sticker, put it on the side, and basically you have a, a budget Leica camera in a sense. Um, can't really do that with any of the other colors. But... What was that kind of initial impressions of the launch, the initial impressions of the Lumix S9, just kind of your overall initial thoughts when you first got the camera and then, you know, using it to now? Yeah, I think that's actually really interesting because when we went out there, I was expecting something that wasn't an S9. I think a lot of people out there were expecting something a little bit more flagshipy, um, but I was very, very happy to have a smaller camera in the full frame lineup. I feel like it was definitely something that the the full frame system of Lumix definitely needed. Um, my first impressions of it were that I loved it. I was really, really happy that they still left the IBIS. If they had taken up the IBIS, that would have been an absolute deal breaker for me. Um, I know of course it had its caveat of not having a mechanical shutter and recording time limits and all that sort of stuff, but we have the IBIS and that for me is the most important part of a Lumix camera. And of course it has a fantastic autofocus too. So yeah, I'd say it's one of those cameras that when you use it for yourself, you understand it. But when you're just reading the spec sheet, you're probably like, oh wait, I don't get it but you just need to get hands on with it to really understand exactly why people that do have it love it so much. I feel like that's a great point because it's like when I first heard about the camera in Japan, I was expecting something higher end as well. But when I first heard about that camera and then I got my hands on it, I was like, I'm so unsure if I would even like this. And then using it on the trip, I'm like, now and then to now it's like this is the camera that like you said in sort of maybe before we start recording this is the camera that i use like 80 percent of the time for all my personal fun stuff for like all right if i'm gonna go take photos or any videos it's like one of the my most favorite things to do and then especially also with the phone um, with the Lumix Lab app and the camera integration, being able to like basically similar to proxy recording, you could start record, stop recording, and the video of your file just instantly transfers to your phone or the photo file instantly transfers to your phone is like gonna be so nice for these next generation of creators. Um, so kind of that launch video, 
there was a lot of drama that kind of happened uh, from this camera. <laughs> so what was your perspective of when that first happened? And then we'll, we'll jump into what was that perspective when the Sony EV-10 Mark II got launched? You know what? It was so interesting because I was lucky enough to go to the S5 II and the S5-2X launch events as well. So it wasn't my first rodeo in terms of going and seeing the new camera before everyone else does and then making the sort of embargo videos. So I was expecting the reception to be somewhat, oh, cool, okay, there's a new Lumix camera. I'm happy. I use Lumix. Cool. That's nice to see the system is growing. But of course, you know, as history would now tell us, that's not how it was sort of taken to start off with. Um, it, I'll be honest. I'll... I understood a lot of the frustration from a lot of the people because Lumix have been... I mean, they're sort of dragging their heels a little bit, if I'm being honest, with their next flagship. And I think, like me, a lot of people were expecting the latest flagship. So when it wasn't that, I think people were very, very quick to sort of jump on the I don't like this camera bandwagon. But one thing that I will say, though, is that if I don't like a product, I just won't buy it. So I didn't see the point in commenting all these negative things about a product that obviously wasn't for certain people. If you need a camera that has an EVF and if you need something that can record for longer than 30 minutes, cool, oh sorry, 15 minutes, cool, go and get, <laughs> that wasn't even a dig, that was just me correcting myself. Um, <laughs> then, then, then sure, you know, don't get that camera, but the whole point of it is that it's aimed at a very specific type of user. And someone that uses the camera in the way that it's intended to be used, I can totally get it. But this is what I was saying earlier. You just need to use a tool for its intended use case. I wouldn't use a GoPro to film a wedding. You know, that's it's it's not its intended use case. So to get annoyed at GoPros for not being good at weddings is just a really silly way to look at things. And I think that's ultimately the biggest issue currently with the industry of YouTube camera reviews and the camera sort Sort of space in general is that everyone wants every single camera to suit them and it's like that's just not the way it works you know not every single tv will suit you you know like not not every product has to suit your use case and i feel like people need to just calm down and realize that at some point there will be the flagship video camera that they're waiting for and the s9 is good at what it does and that's it you know yeah, no, I feel that. I feel like there's so many things the S9 is good for. And I think the issue a lot of people have is it's like, like you said, A, it isn't the flagship camera from Lumix. It's not what a lot of people were hoping and expecting. And they're like, yes, it's finally here. Like, like everyone's like, oh, it's different. But I think the second issue is like, it has basically all the same video specs, minus record limits, you know, minus a fan, all of the other pro features that makes it are on the S5 II and 2X, but it has at its core all the same video specs and photo features that the Lumix S5 II and 2X, again, minus the mechanical shutter, minus the hot shoe, the not being able to connect to flash. It's not supposed to be a professional camera at the end of the day. It's supposed to be a camera designed for those content creators, but even for myself, just as someone who wants to create content um, just for my family or just with my wife, just being able to go shoot stuff and have it look really good instead of using my iPhone. I've been using this a lot more than I've been using my phone and then just sending them to my phone. So it's in a sense replaced the camera phone for me. Um, and if Lumix asked me, I was thinking about this the other day, if Lumix asked me to uh, send back the Lumix S9, I'm pretty positive the next day, as long as I can afford it, I'd be buying a Lumix S9 to replace it because it's made it into kind of my kit and my everyday use in so many different ways. Um, but I would love to hear those thoughts. What was kind of that reaction um, when the Sony EV10 Mark II got launched? Because it's kind of on paper, and since you've used it as well when I was checking out your video, on paper, it's very, very similar cameras besides being full frame and APS-C and then a couple more settings on the Sony. Yeah, I mean, when the ZV-E 10 Mark II was announced, I sort of went to the sort of bigger YouTubers and I was like, you know, I got my popcorn ready and I was like, okay, let's read the comments. Let's see what people are saying about this camera. And lo and behold, everyone was saying pretty good things about it. And the biggest thing that confuses me, right, is the S9 was marketed as a vlogging content creator camera. That was is it, its entire sort of position in the market. And the ZV-E 10 Mark II, the exact same position, was, you know, that was Sony's attempt at the sort of vlogger content creator sort of camera. 
Now, for me personally, to have a content creator do it all sort of very, very quick, very small sort of system, if you like, you need to have IBIS because you're going to be getting B-roll. You're going to be filming yourself at an arm's length. You're going to be doing all this sort of stuff that requires stable footage. So I think my biggest complaint with the ZVE 10 Mark II is not the image quality. It's actually fantastic. It looks great. The dynamic range is great for a Super 35 sensor. It looks good. It was just the fact that the well, the lack of IBIS makes it so hard to use. I mean, I've got it right here. It's such a small little camera. It's it weighs nothing, so realistically, trying to stabilize such a small thing without the need of a gimbal or some bigger equipment, it just sort of defeats the purpose of having a camera for this use case. And there's been a few people, yeah, and there's been a few people that have said, you know, you can just sort of like set it up and, you know, don't walk around with it basically. Just set it up and put it on a tripod. It's like, well then what's the point? You can just get any camera and put it on a tripod, right? Like the whole point is you want to bring a smaller camera out with you and if you're saying just stick it on a tripod and then the IBIS is no issue, well then just stick a, a C300 on a tripod, stick a FX6, stick anything on a tripod, you know? That argument doesn't really translate in the real world for me. So yeah, and again, I don't wanna to bash too hard on Sony because I do think that they are a brand that is pushing other brands to do more in very competitive price points. I just don't get the ZV-E10 Mark II though. That's yeah. just my honest opinion. And I feel like it's nice that it has like those other features. It's nice that it has like a headphone jack, a hot shoe. Um, it has like kind of a lot of things, physical qualities, uh, like the hot shoe. And um, what am I missing? Headphone jack, microphone jack. Oh, it has the HDMI jack and all of those things on the left side of the camera instead of the right side, which just functionally makes a lot more sense if you wanted those features. The Sony missing the IBIS on this camera is it's more important to have like um, image body image stabilization than it is to have, I feel like a headphone jack, to have an HDMI. I feel like if you're buying this small of a camera, you're not likely gonna be trying to plug a monitor and rigging this out because that's not what this camera is designed for. Um, what other key features do you kind of see the S9 have over the Sony? Open gate. Mm. I think that, um, you know, in my video, I sort of make a point about if you are someone that wants to do this sort of content creation stuff, then realistically, you're going to want a delivery for vertical and 16 by 9. That's just the way it is. So I found the ZVE 10 Mark II a lot harder to get both deliverables from like one file. Um, I'd either have to film it twice, one this way and one that way or I would just need to sort of shoot wider for the situation. But yeah, so I think open gate is definitely a massive feature that shouldn't be overlooked if you are someone that wants to use the camera in the way that it's intended to be used. Um, you know, like being able to, well, first and foremost, being able to record in 6K over 4K is another massive plus because you can crop in. So what I find myself doing a lot of the time with the S9 is just shooting wide and then cropping in later because then I can get a nice wide vertical, a nice wide, you know, 16 by 9 cut and then I can also crop in and still get a nice 4k image so um, that's another benefit and I know that there's been people argue and say oh well the 4k on the ZV-E 10 Mark II is just you know down sampled 6k so it's just as good but it, I don't know I'd rather have the actual 6k than you know the down sampled 6k personally so yeah. I feel like there's a sense that the Lumix kind of got released and there was so much drama. People were like saying we we're all basically just shills for this camera company because we went to Japan and got this free trip. But it's like genuinely, actually, a lot of us actually really enjoyed the camera. And I think a lot of people had issues with that. But when the Sony EV10 Mark II got released, um, it got so much praise. Meanwhile, the Lumix S9 kind of got so much hate. Why do you think that is that the Sony got so much praise? Meanwhile, the S9 got so much hate, even though on paper, and similarities, they're very, very similar cameras. I think it just comes down to the fact that Sony has such a large, you know, sort of, I guess, database of users. So people have already invested in the E-mount. There's so many more lenses available that are more compact. So for some people, it makes a lot more sense than what the S9 does. And I can totally understand that. Um, but I also think it comes down to the fact that a lot of the bigger creators on YouTube and other various platforms like TikTok and Instagram they they use Sony and they have some form of connection with uh, some form of connection sorry with Sony so in the same regard as how we were sort of 
painted out to be these, I don't know, biased, being paid off by Lumix people, which by the way, no one was paid to be there. It was not like we were there for financial reasons. We were there because we were interested and we did like the camera. But yeah, I feel like a lot of the big creators have, have got a lot of a, uh, they've got a very big pull over what people like and what they don't like. And you know, if someone that has 400,000 subscribers has said they love a camera and you've agreed with them up until this point, then you have no reason to disagree with them. Whereas when you're a creator that has someone like me, who's got, you know, just shy of 30,000 subscribers, you know, I don't know, I guess there's always strength in numbers. And I feel like hearing positive things from a bigger creator meant this camera is good. Hearing negative, uh, negative things from a bigger creator means this camera is bad. And I think that's a really, really silly way for, you know, this whole niche to act and behave. But that's unfortunately the fact of the matter, you know, you, you look at the numbers and you look at their past sort of accolades and go, OK, I trust this guy more than that guy. Despite the fact that, you know, without sounding big but a lot of these bigger creators only do YouTube. That's all they do. They don't do client work. I'm still working full time doing client work. I know you're still doing four by three films. You know, we're actually shooting with the stuff and Lumix users are the end user. We are the people that are going out and shooting weddings, going out and shooting corporate projects. And I feel like a lot of the, you know, again, not to sound big, I think a lot of the bigger creators just don't do that anymore. They just make YouTube videos in a spare room in their house or in their lockup, you know? So yeah, that's that's the way it is. Yeah, I feel like there's this, it's a time right now where I feel like Lumix cameras and the whole ecosystem as a whole is like ready to kind of like release, you know, obviously eventually when they release these flagship cameras, I feel like it's gonna make really big waves in the market. But for the longest time, I feel like Lumix cameras have been like, this sort of underdog player in a sense, like they have all these amazing features, but they were missing autofocus. All right, now they just got autofocus and they have all these amazing features, but now their full frame options still don't even have, uh, it still is crop 4K 60. So it's like, I feel like obviously once the flagship con camera comes out, I am hoping there's gonna be, you know, something next for that camera. Like there's gonna be something that's not just like basically in a sense, I'm hoping it's not just the FX3, but in a Lumix version, I'm hoping it's something that one ups the FX3. So when Sony does release their next flagship full frame camera, this one would still stand toe to toe with it and hopefully shift up the market but a bit. But I think, like you said, I think there's a lot of brand loyalty to camera systems. Um, and I'm curious, do you see that kind of as a problem as a whole? Or do you think that's like totally fine have brand loyalty just maybe don't hate on people that like other cameras. I think brand loyalty makes the most sense financially, to be honest. Um, when you invest in a lens system, you're almost locked in. And I moved from Sony to Lumix, you know, years ago now when the S5 first came out. And it was an expensive and tedious task to switch over to a different brand. Um, of course, I know a lot of people that have moved from Sony to Lumix and Canon to Lumix and all that sort of stuff. So there's definitely people doing that. But I just think it makes sense. You know, if you're in a brand and you know how to grade their log footage, if you understand how their menus work, if you if you just get the system, then, you know, undoubtedly you're going to want to stay in that system. So I think regardless if the next Lumix flagship beats the next Sony flagship, I think the Sony users will still remain for the most part with Sony because it's just the easier option for them. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. It's you know each to their own. If you if if you like it, cool, stick with it. Um, one thing I will say though is I can guarantee that Lumix's next flagship will still be cheaper than Sony's next flagship. I think in terms of price point, Lumix have always been better than other brands. I mean, I did a video about this a while ago, but when you compare, you know, sort of the, the price of the body than the price of lenses that you'd need to get up and running, Lumix, believe it or not, pound for pound or dollar for dollar, normally work out to be the cheaper option. And you normally get slightly more features with that, you know, spend as well. So that's ultimately one of the reasons why I love Lumix mix so much is because it's just a cost effective solution and the quality of the footage is amazing and photos of course okay well we're gonna put a pin in that little topic because i will be very curious to kind of get your perspective on what you kind of want to see in that next lumix camera um, price point features kind of just diving into it um, but kind of to wrap up this conversation in a nice little bow um, what do you think lumix can do to 
currently, and I'm gonna hit pit in quotes, fix the S9. If you have seen my video, I did an overheating test with the S9 and the ZV-E10 Mark II, and I've done it a few more times since the video just to make sure that I wasn't, you know, well, that the results were consistent. And the S9 can solidly last for about 45 minutes when you're re um, back to back recording it. Um, so I think one of the best things that Lumix could do now is simply increase the recording time limit to 30 minutes or even, you know, sort of 35, 40 minutes if they want to, or give an option like Sony have to basically do a high temperature override sort of function whereby you can go, hey, I'm the end user. I understand that this is dangerous, but I wanna, you know, prioritize longer recording times, you know, select that option. Um, I think if they did either of those two things, that would definitely help to convert a lot of people over to potentially liking the S9, because I feel like that should be enough to make this camera a very viable choice. Of course, I, I'm not gonna say I wish that Lumix made an EVF attachment or anything like that. No, that's just not gonna happen. Um, I, th I think in terms of hardware, the camera is what it is, but with firmware, you can fix that issue. So yeah, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah, I personally feel like I would use this as my YouTube camera, like just talking to the my camera, I'll throw a microphone external and record it and like I would be basically set and it's super small i would love that to be my youtube camera so i guess now for the next conversation just moving on to the next topic this is kind of going to be wrapping up the show but i would kind of love to hear that what was the camera you were hoping for in japan and whatever that camera is what does that look like and what's your hopes for say whatever the next camera is what would it be called what features what specs i know there is a couple videos on what your dream camera is already is on your channel so people can go check that out if they're interested but what would you want that next lumix flagship camera to be so i think their next flagship will be targeting the video user or the videographer if you like not the photographer i think there's already amazing options out there in lumix design for uh, sorry for photo i think the s52 the s52x even the s1 and s1r are fantastic photography cameras you don't need phase detect autofocus for photography. I want people to understand that. Contrast detect is actually better in some cases for photography when it comes to autofocus. Um, so with all that in mind, I think the next camera that I'd like to see would have a box form factor, a little bit more sort of video centric esque. Um, basically, I would like to see an EVA2, but with the full frame sensor, with the face tech autofocus, um, with no crops in the 4K modes, I'm not concerned about 8K. I'm not concerned about anything past 6K. In fact, I think 6K is even overkill at this point. Um, so I, I really don't want them to go down that rabbit hole like other brands have, like, you know, Canon with their 8K raw internally, but you know, no one needs that. I'm sorry, just no one needs that, let's be honest. Um, so. So I think that, um, and I'd also like to see some better high frame rate options. So maybe get the 4K 120p that we've seen in the Micro Four Thirds cameras, put into the full frame cameras. Um, and then I guess the last point would just be a better readout speed. So better processing, so the roller sh uh, rolling shutter performance is better. Um, of course, doing all of that, so you know, higher frame rates, uh, better rolling shutter, um, you know, all the stuff that I just said, that's quite a big task. So it's a lot to ask for. Um, but I do think Lumix are capable. I think that, you know, they, you know, they released the S1H in what, 2019? And that camera was ridiculously good at that time. And now even today, it's still ridiculously good. It's still probably arguably the best looking video from any Lumix camera ever made. So if they can just do that in an EVA2 style body with better autofocus and better readout speeds, then for me, it would be the perfect camera. Question for you is, would you want um, IBIS on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I feel like even though I know C cameras don't normally have IBIS, you know, because they're normally a bit heavier, people like the sort of more handheldy look unless they put it on a stabilizer. I think Lumix have done such a good job of making that IBIS look convincing. And what I mean by that is not have the 
you know, the corner wobbles, have all that sort of stuff. I think the e stabilization modes work really well as well. I think it would be a shame to see a flagship without IBIS personally. So yeah, 100%. Why would you prefer it to not have it? No, I would prefer it personally to have the IBIS, but I know there is um, a camp that's like, I want a box Lumix camera, but with no IBIS. And I do understand like the reasoning behind it. Cause if you want to throw this, you know, this camera on a drone, if you want to throw this camera on a car and have it be sort of more of a crash cam in the higher end market, um, having no IBIS is actually tends to be better for those people because it's just no IBIS. I, I personally want it, um, but I know there is a camp that doesn't want it. So I would personally love to see if they develop something um, where they can physically lock the sensor and it can turn on and off the IBIS like physically to the core and actually have the sensor locked in place. But again, I'm not an engineer. I'm just saying stuff and hopefully it happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, I don't think that I don't think Lumix should be gunning for the Komodo, for example, if that's the sort of camera you're thinking about, the Komodo, uh, the sort of box style high end cinema camera if you like i mean of course it will sort of encroach on that space a little bit but i think lumix has to remember why people love the brand in the first place right it's almost like sony releasing their next flagship to not have autofocus it's like don't shoot yourself in the foot it's exactly what you guys know how to do so just do it and do it to the best of your ability you know right and i feel like this is going to be the camera that is in that price point range where it's like professional video productions that are not shooting, I guess they can be, but not shooting like movies or TVs. And again, they can, but this is gonna be more of that camera that sits in that place where it's like, all right, if you own a video production company, you're shooting social media commercials, maybe even some TV commercials, this is gonna be a camera that's gonna be more budget friendly, but still giving you all the features that other higher end cameras like the FX6 and different cameras like that are giving you, but in a, more affordable body with probably and hopefully better specs than those cameras um and i feel like the other things from the gh7 will hopefully trickle down like 32-bit float recording via the xlr2 the yeah, maybe yeah. re log would be sick in a full frame that would be kind of cool i don't know if that would happen but ProRes raw also would be really cool, especially for us Final Cut editors. Um, I know that's not super helpful for people who are not on Final Cut, but <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, I feel like that is probably an easy thing to transition over. I can easily see them going all see if Express Type B cards, which yes, it's more expensive, but if you're in a more expensive camera body, you probably want higher format media. But any last minute thoughts on the kind of what you would love to see on that camera? No, I think everything that I said basically would be enough sort of thing. I think that would be a really, really cool camera to see enter the market. And I also feel like, you know, people do see Lumix as more of a video centric brand as well. That has been the case since the early GH cameras. The GH4 was the first camera to get 4K, I believe. Then the GH5 came out and it was incredible. Um, so I feel like they just need to continue with their legacy. You know, people that know about Lumix and understand why they're so good, they get it and they buy it and they, you know, they invest in that system. So while I can understand their sort of ploy to try and poach other people away from other brands, I feel like that will just happen naturally. You know, as more and more people start to switch on to Lumix, they'll start to understand why it's a better brand to be using. And I think that if they just take everything that they've done so far, even with, like you said, like with the GH7, put it into a full frame body, give us that box style form factor, make the readout speeds a little bit better, and then boom, you've got an absolute, you know, home run in my opinion. Awesome. Well, that was kind of where this conversation is coming to the end today. Um, where can people check you out? What do you want to send? Where do you want to send people and all that good stuff? You can go to my YouTube channel, uh, Josh Cameron. Nice and easy, that one, just my name. Um, <laughs> my last name's a lot easier to spell than your last name, which is always good. <laughs> um, hey, that's why I have a stage name. <laughs> What's your stage name? I don't know about that. It is Matthew Daniel, but it's like Dane, you smell instead of how you actually spell my last name because my last name's but hard to spell. So the way that I spell it is D A I G N E A U. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. That's the correct way, but on YouTube, I spell it D A N G Y O U, just so it's easier to spell. 
Right, okay. And the pronunciation is the exact same. Yep. Just dang you, okay. don't pronounce the G. Don't pronounce the Okay, dang you, don't pronounce the G. You should put that on a business card. <laughs> 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 um but yeah, no, so my, sorry, I completely digressed then. My YouTube channel, Josh Cameron, that's the best place to check out my Lumix content where I talk about all things Lumix all the time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. And if you guys want to see another episode where I'm talking to another Brit, check out that episode right here with Scott Edwards. YouTube recommends you might like this video right here. Until next one, guys. Peace.